Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's classes will both be on Egypt. The first about a great discoverer, the great Belzoni, and the second about uh, the deciphering, the understanding of hi hieroglyphics. But we start off with this character called the great Belzoni, and you'll learn who he is, and you'll also learn that this is the man who is the real inspiration for Indiana Jones. Everything that featured in Indiana Jones films basically happened to the great Belzoni. But we actually start off in the year 1798. Uh, Napoleon, at that time, was the commander-in-chief of the army of the French Republic. He had not yet declared himself emperor. And he decided to invade Egypt with an army of 36,000 men. His intention was to occupy Egypt as part of an overall plan to take control of the Mediterranean against his worst enemy, the British. But he also intended to colonize Egypt. After capturing Alexandria, he then marched inland to Cairo, where he defeated the then rulers of Egypt, the Mamluks, at the famous Battle of the Pyramids on the 21st of July, 1798. There you see the pyramids in splendid isolation. Uh, they're now surrounded by many houses, an illustration of the Battle of the Pyramids that had took place. Uh, he then made his way into Cairo, captured Cairo, captured lots of gold and silver, and the French were introduced to something they'd never seen before. The idea of the outdoors coffee shop, as shown on this lovely 19th century postcard. Is this important to know about? Well, not really, but what you have to bear in mind is that returning French soldiers took the idea back to Paris, giving us Starbucks. So thanks to Napoleon, basically, we have Starbucks today in many ways. Now, as I said um, at the beginning, uh, Napoleon intended to colonize France, uh, to colonize Egypt, and he wanted to introduce the Egyptians to a much better way of living. He wanted to to develop Egypt, its agriculture, and for this reason, in addition to his 36,000 men in his army, he took approximately 167 French scholars and academics uh, known as the savants. Now the term savant comes from a French word meaning to know, and what Napoleon intended was to use the savants to help in the colonization of Egypt, to help with its administration, bring enlightenment to the masses, the poor people of Egypt who suffered under their feudal rulers, uh, introduced better irrigation to improve agriculture, urban planning and public health infrastructures. So he's very much a product of the Enlightenment. He wants to improve the quality of life for the Egyptian pe people. But he also took along with him some historians because he hoped, we believe, that he hoped to, um, to unlock the secret of the ancient Egyptian writing known as hieroglyphs. What are hieroglyphs? Were the scripts used in ancient Egypt for all forms of uh, official writing. We first hear about the hieroglyphs in European writing when Herodotus of Halicarnassus visited Egypt in 450 BC. Does anybody know where Halicarnassus is? I'm willing to bet that most of you have been there. Bodrum. The first historian, Herodotus, comes from what is now Bodrum. When he was travelling around Egypt, he was told that this form of writing was used by the ancient priest of Egypt. Uh, it contained all forms of secret knowledge. And for this reason, he called it hieroglyphic writing from the Greek hiero, sacred, and glyphos writing. Now, he was told that in this secret writing were all the sacred and secret details of the Egyptian priest. They could predict the future. It gave a record of the past. So it became an obsession amongst people to learn what the hieroglyphs actually said. Well, we don't know if Napoleon believed that there was any truth in this. But we do know that the savants, the historians amongst the savants, were given the specific job 
of recording all the ancient remains of Egypt and especially the hieroglyphs in the hope that it would be possible to read this writing. So after capturing Cairo, this man, Vivant Denon, was appointed by Napoleon to take the savants around Cairo, make a proper record of all the pyramids there and all the hieroglyphic inscriptions. And we've got this wonderful romanticized painting done many years after the event. Napoleon there in uh, the shadow of a tent watching Denon over here as he goes around measuring various ancient monuments and recording their hieroglyphs. Denon eventually became the curator of the French National Museum at the Louvre. But while travelling around Cairo, he made these excellent drawings of various monuments. Uh, here we see one of his illustrations of the Sphinx. And you can see what the savants are doing there, measuring it from top to bottom. This is supposed to be Napoleon watching it there, and that man's using a surveying instrument. And this is another of Denon's drawings showing himself. It's a self-drawing, as it were, of how he actually made all these records of the various antiquities. In the summer of 1799, Denon travelled up the River Nile with a group of French soldiers. After making all these records around Cairo, he made his way to a place called Thebes, the modern name is Luxor. It was known that this had been a capital of ancient Egypt, it was known there were lots of monuments there, so Denon arrived there with a large number of savants, set up a camp there, and eventually stayed for two months. In the middle of the summer, not very nice, wearing very thick clothes, the fashion of the day, to make a proper record of everything they could see. They even left this inscription for us. This was carved by one of the savants on the entrance to one of the temples at Thebes. It begins within the six years of the Republic, and it basically continues how we have been studying the pyramids. We've come here to study and measure everything else to make a proper record of all of this. While Denon was at Thebes, he became particularly interested in one particular temple on the other side of the River Nile. This temple standing quite well like this, uh, carved with a whole series of beautiful figures. Uh, in the middle of the temple, there were the remains of a collapsed, enormous statue known to the local people as Memnon. The name Memnon is actually an Egyptian version of Agamemnon, as in the um, writings of Homer. But Denon had studied the classical histories of Egypt before he got there, and he could recognize that this particular temple was probably the site known to Roman writers as the tomb of Ozymandias. A Roman writer records that this tomb of Ozymandias, and the name Ozymandias is a, another version of the Egyptian ruler's name, Ramses, the tomb of Ozymandias was decorated with an enormous statue. So Denon assumed that this must be the same as the tomb of Ozymandias. Well, he started to clear the sand around this statue. And what he discovered was that originally it had been a single piece of granite showing a seated pharaoh or ruler of Egypt, but it had fallen over in an earthquake and was now lying on the ground he was able to see that it was originally 19 meters high. It must have weighed more than 1,000 tons. Now, just to give you some idea of this particular statue, well, this is a drawing that was made of it in 1838. Um, typical of paintings and drawings of this period, the scale is slightly exaggerated, but you can see there is the head of uh, the Memnon there. Uh, this is a photograph of it as it actually is in place. You've got a convenient scale there. It really is an enormous uh, piece of work, complete with hieroglyphs on one side, now even more badly damaged uh, than it was, unfortunately, when Denon saw it. Denon would have liked to have take, taken this back to Paris or had it sent back to Paris, but it was obviously far too big. So he then started to look around the site for some other statues that he might be able to excavate, dig up, and send back to Paris, where they would feature in the new National Museum at the Louvre. And he eventually found a smaller statue, 
It was still four meters high, again broken in two pieces, which had exactly the same hieroglyphs on the side as the big statue. Well, nobody could read hieroglyphs at this time. Nobody had any idea how to read hieroglyphs. Herodotus, who was in Egypt in 450 BC, tells us that nobody alive then could read hieroglyphs. Well, he was told a tall story because we know that hieroglyphs were still being used in the 4th century after Christ. But Danone can see that this other statue had the same hieroglyphs on, so probably represented the name of the same ruler, and he decided that this one should go back uh, to Paris. Because it was smaller, he called it the Young Memnon. Danone made his way back to Cairo in 1800, he started to make a plan to get the young Memnon say, uh, taken back to Paris. But the very next year, in 1801, just as they were about to start recovering this statue, a British army invaded Egypt on behalf of the Ottoman Sultan. Egypt was officially a part of the Ottoman Empire, but it had been under a separate ruler for 200 years or so by this time. So the British agreed to help the Ottoman government recover Egypt for the Ottoman Sultan. But when the British got there, they realized, hmm, we can get some certain economic advantages here if we take control of the place ourselves. And so they arranged for the Ottoman general then in Egypt, Muhammad Ali Pasha, to become the Vali or Khedive of Egypt. They knew that they could control more or less everything he did. And they started to arrange contracts with him to develop uh, the cotton industry of Egypt. Why the cotton industry? The early 19th century, the late 18th century, had seen a revolution in clothing. The discovery of India, and with it cotton, meant that people no longer had to wear clothes made of wool. They could wear lighter cotton clothing. Britain was developing the cotton industry from the middle of the 18th century, but all the cotton had to come from India. But the British government realized that Egypt had the perfect climate for growing cotton. So if the British controlled Egypt by keeping control of Muhammad Ali Pasha, they could develop Egypt for the British cotton economy. It would be cheaper to send cotton from Egypt uh, to England than to send it from India. So the British government now began to enter into a series of agreements with Muhammad Ali Pasha to develop the agriculture of Egypt and in particular its cotton industry. For this reason, the British government started to advertise in London and other places for engineers to go to Egypt to work on water schemes, irrigation schemes to increase the amount of land that was available uh, for cultivation of cotton. Well, one of the people who applied for a job as an engineer, a water engineer, uh, in Egypt was Giovanni Battista Belzoni, who's got a rather strange history. Belzoni was born in Padua in Italy in 1778. He trained to become a monk, to become a priest. But the French invaded and captured Italy in 1798, when he was just 10 years, uh, 20 years old, and he decided to migrate to Britain rather than live in Italy under French occupation. When he arrived in Britain, he didn't know what to do. He had no particular job. But when walking through the streets of London one day, somebody looked at him and said, I've got the perfect job for you in a circus. Why, says Belzoni? Well, Belzoni was 1 metre 95 tall and enormously strong with it. So he took on a circus job as a circus showman, and he was known as the great Belzoni or the Patagonian Samson. What did he do in the circus? Well, this is his favourite trick. As recorded by an artist in uh, about 18... 1806 or thereabouts, written at the bottom, Signora Belzoni, the Patagonian strongman, has he appeared in performance at Sadler's Wells? And you can see what his best known trick was. He would have a wooden cradle stretched over his shoulders, 
with seats attached to it. And then on this cradle, he would carry um, as many as 11 children or four adult women on both sides. He'd go up from a kneeling position like that. So this is the Patagonian strongman. Here you see him with a group of uh, children. There is no illustration, unfortunately, of him with a group of adult ladies, but that must have been a little bit uh, more difficult to lift up. Well, for one reason or another, Belzoni became tired of the circus life, and having married an English woman named Sarah, he decided to apply for a job as one of these water engineers uh, in Egypt. And so he arrived in Cairo on the 9th of Ju June, 1815, already with a contract signed by Muhammad Ali Pasha to help develop the water system for Cairo. His particular job was to build a large water wheel to lift water from the River Nile, to lift it to a cleaning plant where the water could be cleaned up and used for the population of Cairo, which was growing enormously at this time. This particular illustration comes from a book he wrote towards the end of his life, a, child, a children's book, an account of his uh, work in Egypt. The only problem was that when Belzoni got to Egypt, he saw the pyramids, he saw all these other ancient remain and became totally fascinated by them to such an extent that basically he didn't do a very good job of work. Muhammad Ali Pasha's inspectors came down and basically said this water wheel is no good, it uses humans to lift the water, we want something more efficient, you've lost your job. So Belzoni is stuck in Cairo without a job but fortunately he just happened to meet up with this very important person, Henry Salt. Henry Salt was the British consul at Cairo. He was a collector of antiquities for the British Museum. He arrived there the same year as Belzoni. He'd already sent a large collection of Egyptian antiquities to the British Museum. He'd already just learned that the French had decided to get the young Memnon from Thebes. The French government had paid Muhammad Ali Pasha's uh, officials a bribe to allow this Italian-born uh, man, Bernardino Dravetti, to go as an antiquities hunter to Thebes where he would recover the young Memnon and send it back to Paris. Well, Henry Salt was determined that if anybody was going to have the young Memnon, it should be the British. And so he appointed Belzoni to go and recover the statue. Well, Belzoni was sent down river to find out what Giorovetti was doing. Here we see Giorovetti at work with a whole group of characters. He discovered that Giorovetti wasn't paying the workmen enough money, so the workmen were refusing to move the statue from where it was to the River Nile, from where it could be taken by ship to Cairo. So Belzoni decides to take control of the site for himself. And a gunfight starts between the two of them. One of these scenes in Indiana Jones, you know, the gunfights gun between the different antiquities collectors. Well, this is something that really happened to dear old Belzoni. Dravati having left the site, Belzoni then carried on to look at the site of the tomb of Ozymandias. He was impressed, like everybody before him, by the statue of the Memnon the really big 19 meter high statue that had fallen over and he decided that yes this is something that I must get for the British Museum but I can't get it now I just hope that the French don't come back and try and get it so I will write my name on it this statue belongs to Mr. Belzoni don't touch it otherwise you'll be in trouble and as you can see, we've also got the name of Henry Salt carved on there as well. He came down at a later date to confirm that this statue would eventually go back to the British Museum. It never did. It's still there. Having admired this particular statue, Belzoni started on his main job, which was to recover the young Memnon. Now, the young Memnon was originally four or so metres high, a seated statue, like the Memnon statue, it had fallen over in an earthquake, it had broken into two pieces. So Belzoni basically had to remove 
one piece of stone that was about two meters high, seven tons in weight, and try and get that back to England. He employed a team of 130 men, and it took 17 days to actually tow the young Memnon from the site to the River Nile. Now this is, again, a very exaggerated drawing, as you'll see in a moment. But he eventually got it to the River Nile. It was sent by ship down river to Cairo, taken across land to Alexandria, and then eventually arrived in London uh, in the year 1819. Uh, it's still there. So whenever you go to London, go to the British Museum, and you can see the young Memnon for yourself as it is there. This created a major sensation in England. People in England hadn't really seen anything of ancient Egypt, although a whole number of Egyptian antiquities were taken back to Egypt, uh, to Britain by the British Army in 1801 and 1802. But the display of this enormous statue, beautifully cut out of hard red granite, using stone tools, not metal tools, really impressed the people of London. Belzoni had also wanted to send back to London the feet of the statue and the base of the statue. But he decided that, well, we'll never be able to put it together again. So he decided to leave the feet of the statue where they were. So if you go to Thebes, you can still see the feet of the young Memnon, um, Ozymandias, uh, sitting there at the moment. The interesting thing about this particular side of the story, any of you doing English literature, is that this fact resulted in the writing of a very famous poem in English, Ozymandias, written by Percy Bysshe Shelley in 1818. It's a wonderful poem which talks about the two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, etc., etc., etc. My name is Ozymandias. One version of the name of uh, Ramses. Look on my work, she mighty and despair. It's a very beautiful poem in many ways because it, it brings to uh, a point, it, it brings into sight this whole thing about we live on earth for a while, we might become really great and really famous, we might become rulers of countries, we might set up wonderful statues of ourselves, but eventually time will pass and we're all forgotten. And that was the pers purpose of uh, Shelley's particular poem. Well, Belzoni re received a large amount of money uh, for sending the young Memnon back to London. And this encouraged him to search throughout Egypt for more antiquities. He left Thebes and he made his way up the river Nile to a place called Philae, where he found the remains of a wonderful temple there. Here again, we, we see it in a, a, a painting by an artist called David Roberts in 1839 just a few years after Belzoni was there, so you get some idea of what it looked like in Belzoni's time. He found a wonderful collection of hieroglyphic inscriptions there, which he removed from the walls and put them in storage so that he would send them on to London later. He then went further up the River Nile and became the first European that we know of to visit the amazing uh, site known as Abu Simbel. Again, this is a painting done by uh, Roberts in 1839. This is a temple that's carved out of the rock that marks the limit between Egypt and the country to the south, which we now know as Sudan, uh, but then was known as Nubia. This gives you some idea of its size. This is really one of the most impressive sites in the world. Uh, the only thing I could really compare it with is when you go into the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul for the first time, uh, or if you go into the Pantheon in Rome, it just is so much bigger than you actually expect it to be. Well, Bales only did some wonderful paintings of this. This is how he saw it in, this in his time. And you can see the carved figures inside the temple, the colors still very beautifully visible. Uh, unfortunately, as it is now, uh, the colors have almost all gone. The statues have suffered some damage as well. Well, Belzoni now decided to return back to Thebes. He wanted to do more work in that area. He first made his way to Philae, and what did he find? Drovetti had been there. 
Giovetti had tried to steal the hieroglyphs. Giovetti had smashed them up, broken them up, because he couldn't remove them. So Belzoni follows Giovetti, who's making his way back to Thebes. He arrives in Thebes and finds Giovetti is there before him. Giovetti has talked to the local governor, who says to Belzoni, you can't do any work in this town. So Belzoni decides, well, I'll work on the other side of the River Nile from Thebes in the area of the tomb of Ozymandias. And he specifically decides to go and work in a valley which was no then known as Bedan el Maluk, the Valley of the Dead. We know it today as the Valley of the Kings. By this stage, it was well known that this particular valley contained a number of ancient tombs, something like 18 or so tombs. These were all the tombs of ancient rulers of Egypt. They'd all been robbed. But Belzoni knew that there had to be many more than 18 rulers of Egypt. So he decided to search around the Valley of the uh, Kings, in search, hoping that he would find a tomb that was intact, that had not been previously open. His real hope was to find antiquities that he could collect send back to London and sell to the British Museum. But it was in the course of this work that in uh, 1817 or so, he discovered what he called the Great Tomb. This is the longest and the deepest of all the ancient tombs in the Valley of the Kings. It's something like 120 meters long. It extends to a depth of something like 30 meters uh, below uh, the ground level. When Belzoni found it, the entrance passageway was completely blocked up with dirt and stones, so he had good hopes that this might be an undisturbed tomb, that he could find lots of antiquities and gold uh, when he got inside there. And so he carefully cleared his way through the entrance way and found himself going down a passage that was covered with brilliant paintings. Perfect condition eventually making his way all the way down until he came to a large hole in the ground, which he calls the death shaft. Well, this is what the entrance to that tomb looks like today. It's a lot easier to get into, thanks to this wooden stairway and this wooden rail. Uh, the paintings have unfortunately faded a lot since Belzona's day, but they're still remarkable in many ways. At the entrance of the passageway, he found this enormous deep pit in the ground, 10 meters deep, five by, by three meters wide. When he found it, there was still a wooden plank going across it from one side to the other. But when he put his foot on it, it broke and fell into dust. This was obviously something to stop robbers getting into the tomb. That's why he called it the death shaft. If you went into the tomb in the dark, you would go boom, down there and yeah, probably kill yourself. Seeing the plank there, though, made him realize the tomb had probably been robbed. The next day, he got another piece of wood, put it over the death shaft, and then he made his way further and further into the tomb, discovering it was built on two separate layers, uh, levels, covered with this beautiful series of hieroglyphs, wonderful paintings like this, which he decided to record. And then finally, he made his way into what was clearly the burial chamber, at the very end. All of these passages were, were covered with these marvelous hieroglyphs and uh, wonderful uh, Egyptian carvings. It is the most highly decorated tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, this slide gives you a better impression of the, the colors. You can see they've suffered some damage, but not too much, fortunately. Finally, Belzoni made his way to what was clearly the burial chamber. Uh, there he found an empty sarcophagus. What's a sarcophagus? Well, it's a stone container in which you bury somebody. The name sarcophagus comes from the Greek. The Greeks believed that there were certain types of stone that if you buried a body inside those particular stone structures, the body would completely disappear. Sarco means body, Ophagus means to swallow. Sarcophagus means a body swallower. 
So that's what the actual name means. The sarcophagus itself was made of alabaster, a very beautiful stone which you can see through uh, quite clearly. Uh, the sarcophagus had nothing in it. Belzoni saw that beneath the sarcophagus was another passageway going down. He wasn't able to clear this. And in fact, it was only cleared about two years ago. Uh, and it was found to be 20 meters long. It goes to a maximum depth of 60 meters. And there's absolutely nothing at the end of it. Everybody hoped there wouldn't be, but there wasn't. So Belzoni decided to at least recover the sarcophagus, but he also made drawings, very careful drawings of all the paintings he could see here, so that he could send these back to London and hopefully sell them to the British Museum. Well, this is what the burial chamber looks like today. Uh, you can see the entrance to this other passageway at the end there, with nothing at the bottom. Again, this wonderful ceiling painting showing the gods and the passage of the dead person uh, from the earth to the heaven. Uh, this is a view looking straight up at that uh, ceiling. This is what we know as the Book of the Dead, this wonderful instruction manual ancient Egyptians had that said what was going to happen after you died, what you had to say to each god you met on the way to the final heaven. Nobody's ever explained how somebody could get the information together to write a book of the dead. But ancient Egyptians believed it, that's the important thing. And just a plan of the great tomb there. Well, Belzoni was very pleased with what he found in the Valley of the Kings. He managed to get a number of small antiquities. He sent the alabaster sarcophagus back to London. He now decided to look for something else, another major triumph or discovery. And he turned his attention to the pyramids at Giza. At this time, only one of the pyramids had been explored, and that's the Great Pyramid here. The second pyramid and the third pyramid were still completely unknown. Well, the first pyramid had been opened in about the year AD 20, when Caliph al-Mamun, uh, who then controlled Egypt, uh, decided to open this and find out what gold and silver there might be inside. He couldn't find the entrance to the pyramid, so basically he used his workmen to dig a tunnel into the pyramid. They found a burial chamber, they found a sarcophagus, and nothing else. And then they found a passageway that led to the actual entrance of the pyramid, um, which is why Denon was able to draw it at a later date. Well, Belzoni decided to sit down and find the entrance to the second pyramid. And again, this is uh, an illustration from the book he wrote for children at a later date. And he tells us that what he did was he sat on the third pyramid, he looked at the face of the first and the second pyramids, and he realized one significant thing that nobody else had ever realized before. The entrance to the first pyramid was not in the center, but about 10 meters to one side. And he decided that this was probably where the entrance to the second pyramid would be. And so he decided to uh, employ a whole group of uh, workmen uh, to start digging into this. He had 80 laborers and 160 boys and girls to carry away the dirt. And after 12 days, he eventually found the entrance to the second pyramid. It was filled with all kinds of rubbish, which they then had to dig through to make their way to the burial chamber. Bell's only hoping that this would be intact, full of gold and all sorts of other antiquities. But when he got there, all he could find was a single sarcophagus. We still don't know if anybody was ever buried there. That's a simple fact. But he found this single sarcophagus. Um, that's what it looks like today. Well, he was rather disappointed at this. But nonetheless, he was very proud of his achievement of being the first person to find a way into the second pyramid. So after studying the sarcophagus, making a record of it, he wrote his name on the side of the burial chamber, opened by Belzoni, the 2nd of March, 1818. Wherever you go in Egypt, if Belzoni has been there, you will find his name written there. He was so proud of this particular discovery, though, even though there was nothing in there, 
that he had this medal made to commemorate his success. Giovanni Belzoni opening the second pyramid as we see here. Well, it was now 1819, Belzoni decides to return to England, taking with him all the other antiquities he had found in the Valley of the Kings, what was left of the hieroglyphs he'd taken from Philae, drawings of all the wonderful things he had seen. He wanted to sell all these to the British Museum. He especially wanted to sell the alabaster sarcophagus from the great tomb in the Valley of the King. He knew that this would be worth a lot of money. But when he actually got back to London, the British Museum was happy to buy the small pieces he collected. But he, when he asked for the sum of 2,000 English pounds for the alabaster sarcophagus, they said no. 2,000 pounds in 1820 would be not far short of about a million pounds now, so roughly one and a half million dollars, that sort of thing. What Bell's only decided to do was, okay, I've got to make some money to cover my expenses, I will open my own museum. And he did this in a building known as Bullock's Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly in London, where he opened a museum, people paid money to go inside this, and people suddenly discovered Egypt. English people discovered Egypt as a result of this museum. People became fascinated with Egypt. Belzoni became a rich man thanks to the entrance fees he charged for going in here. And what we see happening in England as a result of this is something that could be called Egyptomania. This is partly because Belzoni himself decided to write a full account of his actual adventures, illustrated with this uh, painting of him as an Egyptian sheikh, and the title page says a narrative of the operations and recent discoveries, etc., etc., etc. Remember, 18th, 19th century books always have very, very, very long introductions. Uh, goes right down to the oasis of Jupiter Ammon in the Western Desert. This becomes a popular bestseller, and in addition to this, of course, he publishes his uh, children's book on his discoveries. But it also set off a fashion for Egyptomania in England. People started building houses that looked like Egyptian temples. This is the Egyptian house in Penzance in the southwest of England. Uh, here we've got another one, the Odd Fellows Hall uh, in Plymouth. And people even took it to the extreme of decorating their houses as if they were Egyptian temples or palaces. Uh, this one's up in Windermere in the Lake District. Now, I'm not certain I would like to wake up in the morning in something like that. I don't know. You might. It depends on how many servants you've got, I think. You know, if you can wake up in the morning, cup of tea, please, something like that. It's probably quite enjoyable. So, Belzoni is now becoming the most famous person throughout Britain and throughout Europe. His book is a bestseller. Thousands of people are queuing up to go into his museum. He's becoming very rich uh, because of this. He is recognized in some ways, if you like, as the first Egyptologist, the first person uh, to really uh, study Egypt. Um, he, his fame is increasing by the day. What happens is the British Museum now gets very jealous of him, particularly the curator of the British Museum. And so what the curator of the British Museum did was to confiscate, to take into the British Museum the great sarcophagus from the great tomb, claiming that this had been illegally excavated. Well, everything that Belzoni took from Egypt and sold to the British Museum, like the Yang Memnon, was illegally excavated. But they particularly wanted to punish Belzoni because he was uh, such a popular figure. And of course, the academics you know, don't like it when other academics become very popular. So they took the sarcophagus from the Great Tomb into the British Museum, and Belzoni got so disgusted at this, he decided, I'm going to leave England forever. My adopted home is not treating me right. He sold the rest of his collection to various private individuals, and in 1822, 
he left England having decided to become an explorer. What he wanted to do was to find a place that is semi-mythical, semi-legendary, the city of Timbuktu. It is in northwest Africa. Uh, it was known to be the centre of the gold trade of Africa. Belzoni hoped to find Timbuktu, that he could make another fortune there. But soon after, after he arrived in West Africa, he died either from dysentery, a waterborne illness, or he was murdered by robbers. We don't know exactly what happened to him. When the news of his death reached London, there was a great deal of sorrow. There was also a great deal of anger about the British Museum having stolen, in effect, the alabaster sarcophagus from the great tomb. Due to popular support for Belzoni's widow, uh, his former wife Sarah, the British Museum agreed to give it to her. She said, I will sell it to you for £2,000, the original sum. But they said, no, we don't want it. Well, Belzoni had spent most of the money he had earned in arranging his expedition to Timbuktu. His wife had hardly any money at all. So she was left poor until a very, uh, an Englishman called Sir John Soane, very important to know about because he was the first person to introduce drinking chocolate to Europe. Oh yes, all these connections come in, you see. You learn a lot more than just great discoveries here. And I think drinking chocolate's a great discovery. Uh, Sir John Soane decided to buy it and establish his own museum uh, where it was placed there in 1823. And he would have a dinner every night at which people would come and pay to join in that dinner around the sarcophagus to raise money for Sarah, the wife of uh, Belzoni. And every evening they would start off by saying, raising a glass of wine and drinking to the great Belzoni. This is the uh, sarcophagus as you see it displayed in Sir John Soane's museum in 1823. And it's very much like that today, except it's got a glass case around it. And it is impossible to take a good photograph of it to actually reveal uh, precisely what it looked like. So that's the story of the great Belzoni. He was no intellectual scholar. He was basically a monk who became a circus strongman. He certainly wasn't what we would call an archaeologist. He dug into sites without making a proper record. He cut hieroglyphs and statues off walls, destroyed many other things um, in the way. His prime motivation, his prime interest, was in collecting artifacts that he could sell to the British Museum. His methods were very often destructive. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, they were very unorthodox, out of the ordinary. But Belzone is important to know about as a discoverer, because in many ways we can look at Belzoni and recognize him as the first person who became an Egyptologist. Howard Carter, who we'll learn about in the future class on Tutankhamun, said of Belzoni that he was, quote, one of the most remarkable men in the entire history of archaeology. But I think really what we should remember him for in many ways is the original Indiana Jones. The stories of the gunfights between antiquities collectors. This is what happened between Belzoni and uh, Drovetti. And you know all those wonderful scenes that you have one in every Indiana Jones film? where somebody walks into a dark passageway and mummies fall out of the wall and you're surrounded by collapsing mummies. Belzoni's description of one of the tombs he entered in the Valley of the Kings. As I entered the tomb, I put my foot down on something that felt like wood. My foot went through it. I realized I was standing on a mummy case and inside it was a grinning face looking up at me. I jumped back in horror only to realize there were mummies on the side of the walls that fell over me in such a cloud of dust and bone that I had to go outside and get a drink before I could continue any further. So that's the story of the great Belzoni. 
the first Egyptologist. And I suspect I might have finished a bit ahead of time. Oh, I only just didn't have my watch on today. So we'll meet back um, in 10 minutes and we'll continue with Egyptology with the story of the Rosetta Stone.